mind. He's he's just having having a fun time this morning. So let's get started. And with our table of contents, we're going to go through goal setting, uh, making a schedule, some more general time management methods, and then the importance of breaks. Okay, so let's get right into goal setting. Um, so first off, we're going to discuss why setting goals is important for time management and staying motivated. So setting goals is something that's going to help us identify what needs to be done. So it's going to give us some clarity on, um, you know, what we're actually needing to do instead of kind of just sitting there with, with no clear vision. Um, it's also going to help us establish our priorities. Um, this is really important as, as a student and just in general, though, in life um, to make sure that you're doing what needs to be done first and like prioritizing different things as they come. Um, and finally, goals are going to help provide direction and purpose as we as we work through them. So we're going to talk about SMART goals specifically. So SMART is an acronym standing for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So essentially, um, these are goals that are going to be better at helping you actually achieve what you're setting up to do because there's kind of some parameters that are going to give you some guidance. So when we start with um, S, it stands for specific. And to be specific, we want to um, be specific in what actually needs to be accomplished. So when we are setting our goals, we want to make sure that things are as specific as possible. Um, so we want to ask ourselves uh, what exactly needs to be accomplished and what defines our goal as being completed. We also want to look at um, who is responsible for the goal coming to fruition. Um, if you're doing goal setting for like a group project or just a goal that involves other people, it can be really important to be super specific about your expectations. Um, just it's going to help you succeed as a team. So divide and conquer and make sure that everyone is able to have a clear vision of what what the goal is and what their role is in it. Um, additionally, you want to look at what steps need to be taken to achieve your goal. So we want to break things down into smaller bite sized pieces. Um, rather than having like a massive task at hand, um, these mini stepping stones are going to help you achieve the main goal that you're setting without getting overwhelmed on the way. It makes the main goal just more likely to be reached because you're having, like I said, those smaller digestible pieces rather than that one massive goal that can sometimes look like a mountain um, when you're at the bottom of it. So um, as we go through our our definition of like what SMART stands for, um, I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind what a goal for Jane, who wants to read more this summer, will look like. And we'll come back to that at the end of everything. Okay, so for in order, sorry, in order for her goal to be measurable, um, we need it to actually, we need it to be quantifiable. So um, you wanna make it so you can actually track your progress and know when you've reached the finish line with your goal. So um, we wanna ask what unit of measurement do we wanna use to achieve our goal? Another way to kind of think of this question is just what evidence will show that you're making progress towards your goal. Um, and then similarly to specific, we just wanna make sure that we're setting those smaller milestones along the way so that by the end we can um, kind of look back at our little pieces of what we've done. Um, and additionally, just having those milestones is gonna let us adjust the methods being used to pursue that goal if we're needing to. Um, for example, maybe you try something new and you know you get to like that first milestone and you're realizing, you know what, this isn't working for me. Now you have that opportunity um, to like slow down and kind of reassess what your next steps are. So for making sure that a goal is actually attainable, this might involve some self-reflection. So we do need to honestly ask ourselves, um, you know, what does our past track record look like and how can we make sure that our goal reflects a mixture of our current motivation and like our past, as well as our current abilities. Um, you know, you can reach for the stars and um, if you're doing that and that's completely unattainable, then ultimately you are gonna be frustrated and disappointed when you aren't able to complete a goal. Um, and that just means that you're you're more likely to give up on that goal or, um, you know, potentially even less likely to um, pursue goals in the future using using this method. So 
by genuinely actually looking at how we did things in the past, um, we're going to set our future selves up for success in setting goals that are actually attainable. Um, so again, kind of want to take in our, our past track record as well as our current motivation and um, any current like new skills that we're going to try. So obviously maybe in the past your track record wasn't good, but now you have that really, really strong motivation. So maybe, you know, got to find that balance in, in that self-reflection there. Um, I have an example here with, with a final grade calculator. So let's say that you wanted to get a 90% on your final, um, but going into your final, your overall grade is only a 60. So if your final is worth 25%, will you be able to make your goal? Um, so if we actually put this into a final grade calculator, which um, I do encourage any students to, to utilize, um, when we put this into our calculator of a current grade of 60 and you're wanting a 90 when your finals were 25%, the calculator is going to tell you that you actually need 180% on your final. Um, and that's just not really attainable. Um, so you just need to adjust your goal um, to, to your limits as well as your circumstances. Um, you can't change that you're currently at a 60 and you can't change that your final is worth 25%. So again, kind of that self-reflection of, okay, I'm at a 60 overall. Let's just try and maybe increase my grade by 5% so that you'll be at 65% by the end. Um, that's, you know, a much more realistic and attainable goal. And um, you know that you'll need to do your best to reach an 80% on your final to reach that goal. Okay, so now onto the R of SMART. So in order for a goal to be relevant, we need to make sure that it fits into the big picture. Um, so we wanna ask ourselves, what is my big picture? When asking this question, it can be really helpful to ask kind of what the larger long-term goal is. For example, maybe your long-term goal is to go to university and become a nurse. Um, and I will mention that I made this presentation kind of with um, high school students in mind. So some of these examples might be um, geared towards some of their experiences. But let's say, like I said, your long-term goal is to go to university and become a nurse. Um, or maybe you need a certain grade to get a scholarship. Um, there's a lot of things that can kind of help get you motivated and a lot of things that we can we can remember, okay, that's why I'm doing this. This is what I'm looking forward to. Um, sometimes, you know, when it comes down to it, if if we are doing something that maybe it's harder to find that long-term goal, but we do need to do it, um, it might look like maybe making up reasons to get motivated. For example, um, if I reach this goal, then I can treat myself to X, Y, Z thing that I've been wanting. But yeah, these factors of kind of finding why something is relevant may tie into why the goal is being set in the first place and why it's important to you. And it can just kind of help put things into perspective sometimes. Um, we also want to ask ourselves, like I said, why is this goal being set in the first place? Why is it important to me? And we also want to ask, um, is this goal truly going to help me overall? So um, sometimes it can be really helpful to take a, a hopeful approach to why things are relevant, especially when motivation is running low, um, you know, when midterm season hit, when final seasons hit. Um, for me personally, I'm going to give an example. I took physics 20 in high school and I absolutely hated it. Um, I had to put way more time and effort into that class than any class that I had taken before. And I just didn't really find the content enjoyable. Um, but I was able to get through this class by reminding myself of my overall goals for the future. Um, one of which is traveling. And while I wish it was, traveling is not cheap and it requires um, that you get like a pretty well-paying job so that you can do that. So I knew that I needed to get into university and that um, physics 20 was gonna affect my overall grade point average. So it was something that I was like, hey, I just have to do it. And that was my motivation was, was looking really, really far into the future at traveling as a long-term goal. Um, I had another friend who was in the same boat as me with this class. She also really did not like Physics 20. Um, I'm sorry if anyone loves Physics or Physics 20 and has taken it. Um, but for my friend, all it took for her to finish the class was just that she would never have to take another Physics class once she finished um, Physics 20. So everyone's big picture is different and the way that everyone finds motivation is gonna look different as well. Um, so it's important to ask yourself what motivates you. I'm just going to pause for a quick second here. My cat's being a little funky. Okay, so if you're ever needing some motivation, 
Um, one thing that I always recommend people do is just make a bucket list of kind of some of the things that you want to do in your life. Like I said, for me personally, a lot of my bucket list includes different places that I want to travel to. And having this list kind of just reminds me of why I need to set goals for the future. Um, additionally, we're going to talk a little bit super briefly about vision boards, sometimes if you're a visual person, but just in general, um, having a vision board is really going to help you see what your goals and what motivates you. Um, so let's let's check that out on the next slide here. <laughs> so these are just some examples of people's vision boards that I took off of Pinterest. Um, for the one on like the left, we can see you know, some travel destinations that someone is wanting to go to, as well as I see some some food. So maybe that's something that they're also wanting to try. Um, they've got some things that they use as self-care as well. Like there are some pictures of them like at the gym and meditating. Um, there's journaling and mindfulness if you look there closely as well. Um, so it's always good to include ways that you can take care of yourself on your vision board too, because um, when it comes down to it, we we do need to provide ourselves with with that time to rest in addition to time to achieve our goals. Um, and we'll talk, you know, a little bit more about how important it is to give ourselves goals later um, in this presentation as well. Um, yeah, with both of these vision boards, I don't think either of them have kind of like their what they want their future house to look like. Um, that's something that I always include on mine because it just kind of helps me put things in perspective and keep my motivation up. Um, for some people, material things can also be important. I've seen um, lots of people, like one of my friends, she has like musical artists that she really wants to see in concert on her vision board. Um, on the right side, we can see someone has like, I assume their dream car um, in their vision board. You can also include motivational quotes and some reminders. Um, on that left vision board, it looks like someone has like some pictures of family and friends that currently motivate them. Um, but honestly, a vision board is very like personal. And the main point of a vision board is just to kind of remind yourself what your big picture looks like um, or what you want it to look like. So I encourage you to be super hopeful when you make your vision board. Um, this is a time where, you know, it can be nice to just reach for the stars and think really, really long term about what you want your future to look like and how that's going to help motivate you. Okay, so finally for SMART, um, we do, this is so important, we want our goals to be time-based. Um, so we need to set some limits in how long we're gonna spend on our goals and our timing in general. So um, we want to ask, what is the time frame for achieving the milestones associated with the goal? Um, and then we also want to ask, what is the time frame for determining that the actual goal was achieved? So an easier way to kind of think of this question is just what is the deadline? Um, so remember that when we looked at making our goal specific, so the S of SMART, uh, one of the questions that we want to think about is how we can break our goal into like mini milestones so that our big goal is more digestible. Um, so we want to consider setting time bounds on potentially each of these smaller milestones. Um, again, so you can kind of track your progress and make, think make sure that things are getting done in a timely manner. Um, for example, like let's say that your goal was to read a novel by um, September 24th. Like your goal was to read a novel by tomorrow. Um, if you set that goal like two weeks ago and you didn't have like any, any like specific plan around how you were going to reach that, you might be here today and be like, oh, I haven't even started. Um, so just having those milestones is going to make sure that you are kind of holding yourself accountable um, and again, it'll just kind of give a little bit more structure to your goal. Okay. Um, and with that deadline piece, it's really important to have a deadline chosen so that your goal does have a time-based component. Um, sometimes if we don't have a deadline and we're like, oh, we'll do it eventually, um, it sometimes doesn't get done because there isn't that deadline set. Um, Sometimes it means you just choose a day and you say, okay, this is when I'm going to finish it by. You put it in your calendar and that's when you're going to have it done by. Um, other times, obviously, sometimes as a student, it's very much defined for you. Um, but having this time-based component and kind of doing this pre-planning might provide some insight into whether or not your goal is achievable and realistic or if you do need to go back to that A in uh, SMART and adjust a little bit. Okay, 
So um, we're going to apply what we've learned to Jane's goal of wanting to read more this summer. This is something I'd mentioned at that first slide. So specifically um, for this example, we're going to, Jane, I guess, is going to ask what exactly needs to be accomplished and what defines her goal as being a completed goal? Who is responsible for her goal and what steps need to be taken to achieve her goal of wanting to read more? Um, for measurable, we're going to talk about what unit of measurement Jane wants to use. For um, attainable, so that A of SMART, um, we're going to say, you know, what does Jane's past look like? What um, does her past look like and how is this going to affect the attainability of her current goal? Um, with relevant, we want to look at what uh, Jane's big picture is. You know, why is this goal being set in the first place? And is this goal going to help her overall? And then finally, with time-based, again, what is the time frame for achieving the milestones associated with the goal? What is the time frame for determining um, if the actual goal was achieved? So um, these are some things that I came up with um, around like possible ways that Jane could define this goal, making it um, a SMART goal. So for a specific, um, you know, Jane saying, oh, I want to read more is it's pretty vague. So with being specific, I chose that she wants to be um, for the summertime, she wants to read four books. So um, we're going slight, to jump slightly to measurable um, because we're going to specifically define reading more using the number of books as a unit of measurement. So specifically, like I said, Jane is going to make her goal to read four books this summer um, and completely reading all four of those books will define the goal as being completed. So Jane is responsible. This is not a group goal. It's just on her. Um, and in terms of the steps that will make this more digestible, Jane will set aside a set amount of time to read in the evenings. Um, again, having that specific set amount of time and that specific time in the evenings set aside. With measurable, like I said, uh, we're going to use books as a unit of measurement, and we're going to specify that they are medium-sized and not um, like 600 plus page books, because that might not be super attainable. Um, for attainability, we're going to say that in Jane's past history, um, she often finishes about a, like a book in a month. So while reading more isn't a specific goal of hers, um, <laughs> um, reading roughly two books per month is going to be realistic because maybe you know she was reading that one book a month casually but now she's reading she's going to read those two with that motivation of wanting to read more um, kind of fueling it for relevant um, the overarching goal or big picture is that Jane wants to read more so in terms of motivation and why this goal is being set in the first place maybe Jane finds it relaxing and um, she's purposely putting this into her routine in the evenings as a way for her to relax and unwind, which is just going to help her overall well-being. Um, finally, for time-based, since this goal is to read more specifically this summer, that means that Jane is going to have July and August to read these four books, which means that the start of the school year could be defined as her deadline, or maybe September 1st could be her deadline. Uh, making, again, making goals time-based can be really important. Um, so Jane might acknowledge that if it's four books in two months, that means she needs to be finishing a book about every two weeks. Um, so building on defining what, quote unquote, reading a little every evening under the specific means um, to make it time based and very specific. Let's say that the four books Jane has chosen to read were all 300 pages. Um, so according to Google, most people will take about eight hours to read 300 pages. So eight hours times the four books is gonna be 32 hours. And if we divide that in half, that's about 16 hours of reading per month. And with four weeks a month, that's four hours of reading each week. Um, with seven days a week, if Jane reads about 30 to 35 minutes a day, she'll reach her goal by the end of the summer. So um, that was like a lot of math, but you can kind of hear that kind of working backwards of, okay, so this is how many pages I'm roughly gonna be reading. Um, this is how many hours it's going to take me, how many hours do I have in a month, how many hours do I have in a week, and then subdividing it finally into how many hours or time, I guess in this time it's minutes, um, she'll be needing to read a day to meet 
this uh, goal. Um, and that two week mark of, you know, about every two weeks she should be finishing a book is really going to help be a guiding milestone because maybe she gets to week three and she's like, oh, I haven't finished a book yet. So I guess I might need to reevaluate or I might just need to set some more time aside for reading. So let's talk about making a schedule. So first off, let's talk a little bit about cramming and why it doesn't work well. Um, so again, kind of with, with students in mind, if we're realistic, um, almost everyone that I know has crammed for an exam before, and this may be due to a lack of time management um, or things taking longer than expected without having that buffer room. Um, so really, honestly, everyone has been there and everyone has likely crammed at least once in their life. Um, but if we can avoid it, we want to because cramming doesn't really work well. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, for example, when we look at our brains and memory, it can kind of be helpful to think of our brain like a sponge. Um, and studying is kind of the equivalent as placing our brains in water. So just like sponges are only able to absorb so much water at a time, our brains are the same way. Our brains need that rest time so that they can, you know, kind of quote unquote, wring it out. Or if we want to think about this in memory terms, like have that transfer into like our long-term memory so we actually do remember it in the future um, but giving ourselves this time to to quote unquote ring out that information means that we're going to be able to absorb more material later so cramming it's kind of like having an already saturated sponge and then still expecting that sponge to be able to absorb more water which is just not really realistic um, so with cramming you're just not likely to uh, recall the information that you need in your exam, as well as if you, you know, plan your goals and you kind of have your, give yourself the time. Um, in addition, cramming can just cause a lot of stress. It can cause memory fatigue. Um, it can affect your ability to concentrate in your exam too, because you just spent the last little while cramming without giving yourself a break. So, um, just not good. <laughs> and additionally, if information ever does come up, so like say you, you just crammed for one of your classes. Um, if this information does ever come up in a future class or just even a future section of that class, um, you're probably not gonna remember it as well because cramming really only leaves things in your immediate short-term memory. So it's not really integrated into your long-term memory store for you to call upon later. We're gonna watch a quick video on what the Pomodoro technique is. Um, if anyone, if you can't hear it, just please unmute and let me know. Hi everyone, it's Yanis here. And in this video, we will explore what is the Pomodoro technique. If you want to improve your focus, then this technique might be exactly what you need to try before looking any further. If this is your first time on this channel, then make sure you subscribe and hit the bell like to get updates on my latest videos about time management and productivity. The Pomodoro Technique is a time management method developed by Francesco Cirillo in the late 1980s. The technique uses a timer to break down work into intervals, traditionally 25 minutes in length, separated by a short break. Each interval is known as Pomodoro from the Italian word for tomato. Here are the steps that you have to follow if you want to improve your focus and concentration following the Pomodoro Technique. Step one, choose the task. This will give you one focus point where you will be directing all your attention. Step two, set timer. Set your timer for 25 minutes. Make sure that you close all unnecessary tabs on your computer and turn on do not disturb mode on your phone. Step three, focus. Here you do one thing only. Work on the chosen task until you hear the sound of the timer. If you do get distracted by your thought or something else, then write it down on a piece of paper and get back to the work. For this reason, I like to keep my journal handy. Step four, take a five minute break. Once the 25 minutes are over, you have to take a quick and refreshing break. Step five, repeat. After the break, you repeat all the steps again to get another 25 minutes of focused work done. You repeat this process four times and then have a longer break of 20 minutes. And that is a whole process of using the Pomodoro technique to improve your focus and concentration. Okay. It's not going to let me exit this video. Hmm. Okay. 
Okay, there we go. Oh, no, it's still not letting me to exit. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Hey, everyone. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's Yanis here. So, um, what makes the Pomodoro technique so um, effective is that it builds consistency and it helps you establish routines and consistent work habits. Um, sorry, I'm just making sure my computer is still still good. It looks like it is. So um, the Pomodoro technique is really effective at combating distractions and multitasking, which um, is really inefficient as well. <laughs> so because the Pomodoro method makes us focus on our task at hand, um, it just really provides like I said, that focus so that we're not getting distracted by anything else in our environment. Um, when people study, they often ask themselves, you know, should I work on this task instead? Or we'll say things like, you know what, taking a break right now seems good. I'm really craving um, like a snack right now. So I'm just going to go get one. And the list goes on. And while these things aren't like inherently bad, um, these small interruptions can kind of add up and it, it does take that energy to to refocus our attention once it's lost on these thoughts. So the Pomodoro method, like I said, is really just going to help us resist kind of these self interruptions um, and it's going to retrain our brains to focus as well. So um, I did want to mention, so some people like to do 50 minutes of studying at a time and then they'll do a 10 minute break. And then they do this twice. So it ends up being the same amount of studying time, um, kind of like the video mentioned. Um, but some people just like having that that longer period of uninterrupted study time. Um, and this works for some people, but for other people, they find that they can't maintain their focus during that 50 minutes when compared to those 25 minute intervals. Um, for me personally, it really depends on what I'm working on specifically. So if I'm working on... Um, you know, some memorization tasks, then I find I can really only do 25 minutes versus if I'm um, writing out my notes um, and like summarizing, I find that I can do that 50-10 split. So just kind of play around and see what works for you. But let's review the steps super quick. So like the video said, you want to pick a task and you want to be specific. So think less, I'm going to study science. Um, think more, I'm going to make cue cards for science, or I'm going to do the practice problems for math. Um, you want to take those broad strokes of just, I'm going to study the subject and turn them into a smaller 25 minute task. Um, then you want to set that 25 minute timer and you don't want to turn it off until you get to that break time. So during this 25 minutes, you want to focus on the task that you've chosen. Um, the video mentioned putting your phone on do not disturb or like silencing your notifications. Um, there are also apps you can download that lock you out of your phone for a set amount of time too, if that's something that you struggle with. Um, for me, this past exam season back in April, I used um, an app called Planty where I like plant a tree. And if I don't make the full 25 minutes without checking my phone, um, even if it's just to check the time, then my tree like doesn't grow fully. Um, and then like the video said, we can also consider having a journal so that if any distracting thoughts come up, we can really quickly write it down. For example, let's say you're studying something um, and you are like, you know what, I don't know what I'm going to have for supper. And then the idea of I'm going to have lasagna comes up. Now you can just write that down on your journal and leave it and come back to it later. Um, so then step four, you are going to take that five minute break. During this break time, you want to get up and move your body if you can. Um, and it's recommended that you don't just reach for your phone, especially if you're doing your studying on a laptop or some sort of electronic device that gives off blue light. You want to give your eyes time to rest. And it's just better for you if you are able to kind of get up and move. Um, and then the final step. So after about two hours or four Pomodoros, so if we're doing like 25 minutes is one Pomodoro. So after four of those, you're going to take a 15 to a 30 minute break. Um, so again, this is now your time. Maybe change where you're sitting maybe go eat, um, anything that you need to do. Um, okay. So like I said, during your breaks, you wanna go to the bathroom, stretch, walk around um, and give yourself a, a break from screens. As I mentioned, some people do like to do that 50, 10. Um, I would recommend that you, like I said, try out what's gonna work best for you. Um, and then at the bottom of the screen, I do have a couple of timers linked. 
Um, there's lots of options. So if you just Google Pomodoro timers, you'll get lots of websites that have them. Um, the link on the screen is my personal favorite, like that first Pomodoro timer is my favorite because it lets you enter and keep track of the tasks that you're giving yourself. Um, additionally, some people, myself included, sometimes I'll use um, thing like videos called study with me. So I'll go on YouTube and I'll search up study with me Pomodoro. Um, and then it's kind of like I'm studying with that person who who's on that YouTube video because they're also using that 25 uh, five split. And it just really forces me to take my breaks. Um, and yeah, it can also just be helpful to kind of feel like you're studying with someone. It can offer a little bit of motivation because you're like, if that person on the video can do it, then so can I. So with the Pomodoro method, kind of throwing it back to our conversation that we just had on SMART goals, we want to be realistic with how long it takes us to do our task. Um, so you do want to set out some time when you're making your schedule to to actually go through and kind of plan out your tasks. So rather than just saying, like I said, um, working on my paper, you want to think realistically about how long it's going to take you to, to do this paper. Um, and remember to bring in that attainability piece. How long did it take you to write this paper or something similar last time? Um, and doing this, you hopefully won't underestimate how much time you need um, because the last thing that we want to do is not give ourselves enough time. Um, so as we can see on the screen here, this person said, you know, writing that first or writing the article's first draft is going to take me one, two, three, four, five, six Pomodoros. Um, and then they're giving themselves 25 minutes to check their emails and messages. And they're giving themselves 50 minutes to plan article promotion and so on. So, um, due to um, the numbers today, we're not going to go through and, and practice this, but I encourage anyone who's watching this um, or anyone who's watching the recording of this to scan this barcode. Um, also, the link I think will be sent in the chat as well. Um, I'm just practicing making a rough draft of what a weekly, daily, or monthly schedule could look like you. So the QR code is going to direct you to those templates. Um, so if you start by looking at uh, the day template, um, you can make a rough schedule for your day tomorrow. So you want to start by filling in your non-negotiables. Um, for example, if you have any extracurricular activities that you must attend or like classes, fill those in. Um, and then I also always fill in what time you normally sleep and wake up, as well as what time you eat. We cannot be neglecting our, our sleep and our eating either. Um, then you want to break down your tasks for tomorrow. So we want to roughly estimate how long each task is going to take, like we just said on that last slide. Um, and we're going to ask ourselves which ones need to be completed first um, or which ones need to be completed by tomorrow. Now we're going to put those tasks into our schedule um, and we're going to see how much free time we have left or if there's any tasks that will have to be completed the next day instead of tomorrow. Um, so some tips to keep in mind when we are setting our, our schedule is we want to make sure that we're using those SMART goals so we have direction and motivation. Um, we also want to make sure that we are prioritizing. So it's super important that you ask yourself what needs to get done first and that you prioritize those tasks, um, even if they're not ones that you're, you're looking forward to. We also want to be flexible. We want to give ourselves wiggle room in case some things take longer. Um, you know, sometimes we can plan and life happens and things go differently. So it's always just important to be aware of your boundaries. Um, don't be so flexible that you accept requests and other responsibilities that you aren't able to get everything that you're wanting done. Um, for example, if a friend asks you to hang out, uh, but that means sacrificing the time that you, you really do need to study, um, you know, you can either ask them if the hanging out could be studying together, or, you know, you can set that healthy boundary of just saying, I really appreciate you thinking of me and I would love to hang out, but I just don't have the time for it right now, maybe another day. Um, and be flexible with yourself as well. Again, like I said, sometimes life happens and things come up. Um, and that just means that we just have to, you know, adjust, which ties into our next thing. So um, sometimes things aren't going to go the way that we, we initially planned, but we don't want to prevent this or we don't want to let this um, lead to us giving up. Instead, we want to review what uh, contributed to things going differently so that maybe in the future, um, if it's something that we can prevent, then we can we can do that in the future. Um, obviously, if it's not preventable, then 
still taking that time to kind of self-reflect and make sure that we're doing okay, like checking in on ourselves is also so important. Um, additionally, so let's say again, you're working on the, your, your schedule for tomorrow and you're working on something and you're really getting into the groove of it, um, but you technically scheduled that you would switch, just consider moving your schedule around so that you can continue working on it and um, work on what was originally for that time block later. Um, and yes, make sure that you will have some time to move that original task so that it still gets done though. So if you, let's say I was studying um, my interpersonal relationships psychology class and I was like, I'm going to do it from 9.45 to 10.45 and then 10.45 hits and I, I'm like really into the swing of things. Um, and at 1045, I'd initially said that I was going to do my human memory class. Um, maybe that just means that I continue working on my interpersonal psychology. And then later in the evening, I work on my human memory stuff. Um, you know, just being flexible with ourselves and adjusting what we, what we need to. Um, again, we're going to talk about this in greater detail later, but schedule and breaks throughout your day. Um, they're so important in giving your mind and your body some time to rest and just recuperate. Um, again, being realistic, tying into that R of SMART goals, we wanna make sure that we're being realistic with how much time our tasks are gonna take us. Um, and sometimes it can also be helpful to kind of think about your energy levels at specific times. Um, you know, for me personally, once it hits kind of 7 p.m., I acknowledge that my brain is, is starting to kind of slow down from a day of school and I'm not gonna be able to work as quickly as I was at 10 a.m. in the morning. We want to be consistent in our schedules as much as we can be. Uh, research shows that having a relatively regular routine, especially when it comes to studying, is actually good for you. Um, so with it being routine, you're kind of ready every day to, to study or do the tasks that you're, you're wanting to. It'll help reduce procrastination and overall will help you manage your time better because your body um, knows what to expect and it'll know, it knows that you'll be studying or doing that task every day. Um, and finally, experiment. Um, like being flexible and adjusting, experiment with what time blocks work best for you. Um, I have a friend who swears by doing three hours of work at a time. So she'll do like three sets of Pomodoros, if that makes sense. So it'll be 25, five minute break, 25, five minute break. And she'll do that three times in a row. And then she'll take a longer break. Whereas I find for myself, I can only do two hours and then I need to take a break because otherwise that third hour is just not very productive for me. So Find what works best for you. Okay, so let's talk um, more generally about just some other uh, time management methods that there are available. So this first one is called the um, Eisenhower matrix. Matrix, sorry. Um, and this is just a really simple way to make sure that we are pri prioritizing the right things. Um, this matrix kind of helps us sort our to-do list um, and it kind of prevents our to-do list from just being one really, really long list that becomes overwhelming. So the matrix is based off of the urgency and the importance of the task. So when sorting things into the matrix, all you have to do yourself, all you have to do is ask yourself, is it urgent? Is it important? So in the do section um, of this matrix, and just for those who are seeing, so we have do, um, on the left, we have decide on the right. Underneath on the left, we have delegate and then we have delete. So for that do section, these are tasks um, that need to be done, you know, maybe today or tomorrow or no later. Like they, they need to be done right away. Um, and as we can see with this matrix, they're classified as both important and urgent. Um, in decide, this is the section of tasks that are not urgent, but they're important to us. Um, you may want to attach a deadline or choose a date to do things that fall into this section so that they don't continually get pushed to the side. Um, because sometimes when things aren't urgent, they are the things that kind of get, get pushed back for us. Um, for the delegate section, so um, these are tasks that are not, that are, they are urgent, but they're not necessarily important. Um, you want to make sure that you check in with the people that you're giving these tasks to. Um, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna restart this delegate section because I don't think that quite made sense. So with this delegate section, um, if we have tasks that we are able to kind of help, we're able to kind of delegate to other people. So maybe it's something that is urgent, 
um, but it's not important to us. So we're able to kind of pass it off to other people um, in a way that's like, it's it's healthy to do that. Um, then we, we want to do that. So if we are delegating a task, we still want to make sure that we're checking in with the people that we're giving the task to um, so that it does still get completed on time. So with group projects, for example, this might look like providing your group mate with where they can get the information for the section that they're doing um, and then checking in on their progress a couple of days before the deadline so that you aren't rushing to fix their work the night before. Um, finally, for tasks that are in that delete section, you just want to remove them from your list. You're saying like, this isn't important to me and it's not urgent. So um, you can just get rid of it. Or you can kind of put this at the bottom of your to-do list if it is something that you eventually would like to do. Okay, we're gonna watch another really quick video. I'm not gonna go full screen for this one though. Hey, you there. Are you putting off doing some tasks, updating that portfolio, writing that resume, making that important phone call? And then what happens? Yes, at the end of the day, you're feeling under the weather. You're fed up. And with that, you go to bed. So here's a tip. From now on, eat the frog in the morning. Tackle what you're up against. Don't procrastinate. Eat it in the morning. Then your day starts well. And in the evening, you sleep better. Because sleeping with a frog is no fun. It croaks, it moves, and also feels a bit dirty. That frog, that's your dissatisfaction. And that costs energy. Unnecessarily. Is the frog too big? And swallow it all at once. Then make a few small frogs. Eat the frog will clear the fog. Okay, there we go. Um, so it's kind of a silly analogy. Um, and it comes from the book called Eat the Frog 21. Uh, or Eat the Frog 21 Great Ways to Stop Procrastinating and Get More Done in Less Time by Brian Tracy. So if anyone is wanting some reading material around um, time management, that might be a book for you. But this really is a helpful tool to kind of avoid procrastination of things that need to get prioritized. Um, and it fits really nicely into the Pomodoro method as well as the Eisenhower matrix. Um, so like the video said, we want to break the unwanted thing into smaller pieces so that it's less overwhelming um, and it's more likely to com be completed. And then we do want to put it in our schedule first thing in the morning so that we can't avoid it and it gets done. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, pardon me, um, eat the frog and the premac principle. Um, so the premac principle is a psychological theory that involves using an enjoyable reward as an incentive to completing an unwanted task. So maybe you're going to eat the frog um, and then you're going to quote unquote eat something yummy or this is like your reward after it. Um, the thing though is that you don't want to let yourself have this reward until the frog is done. So one way to kind of think of this, it's kind of like how your parents used to make you eat all of your vegetables before you could have dessert. Um, you want to actually eat all of those vegetables before you give yourself the dessert. Uh, but this way, you know, you have that, that motivation, that reward kind of waiting at the other end for you. Okay, so now let's talk about Parkinson's loss. This is another time management technique that we can use. Um, so it's kind of based off of the quote, you know, work expands to fill the time available for its completion. So um, have you ever said, or maybe you've heard someone else say the words, I work best under pressure? Um, from for me personally, I won't lie. I've started papers the day before they were due because I just couldn't bring myself to do them um, because I felt almost like I had too much time and that there wasn't enough pressure to motivate me to work on the project. So if you're in the same boat as me, um, then you might wanna try Parkinson's law as um, it's kind of based on, you know, if you only give yourself so much time to complete a task, then you will make yourself complete that task in that time. Uh, so if you give yourself eight hours, like we see on the, the diagram on the screen, if you give yourself eight hours to finish a task, you'll probably use that full eight hours um, because that's how much time you've given yourself. So the idea is to provide yourself with enough time to finish the task, um, but not provide yourself with too much time. So it's about kind of finding that sweet spot so that you have that max efficiency. Um, and again, with using this law, it is really important always to fall back onto that attainability piece that we talked about during SMART goals. So if your essay took you five hours to write last time, 
don't give yourself an hour to do it um, this time because if that's what you're doing, then you're just allotting yourself to little time and you're probably not going to finish it in an hour unless you're like a really speedy essay writer. I don't know. But um, instead, it might be more helpful to tell yourself that the deadline for the essay is, you know, three and a half hours away and kind of almost trick yourself into believing that. Um, this can be really helpful to think about when you're making your schedule and using the Pomodoro method. So instead of blocking off five hours to do this task, if you know that you can realistically do it in four, um, just block off four hours to do it. And then you have an extra hour to maybe study something else, maybe take a break, get an extra hour of sleep, whatever you need to do. But again, the idea here is just making sure that you give yourself enough time to finish a goal while not giving yourself so much time. Um, because if you give yourself too much time, you will take all of that time. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention uh, your study environment. So here are just some quick tips and reminders. Um, one is to make sure that you have enough space. If you feel physically cramped, um, you're going to spend time trying to like figure out where you can put your study materials. Um, and you're also more likely to get distracted by the fact that you aren't fully physically comfortable, which kind of ties into this next point of make your space comfy. So um, as much as possible, wear something that's comfy enough for you to study in. Um, make sure that your chair is comfy if possible and um, just do things that are going to make your space feel comfortable both physically but also mentally that you can actually study. Um, you want to clear any distractions away and keep your space uh, neat. You don't want to be spending time being distracted with, um, you know, the things in your space and cleaning distractions may also look like moving from where you're studying to another study space. Um, so for me personally, I find it really distracting to stay in one place for too long when I'm studying, um, almost because I, I've been there for so long that I'm paying attention to the things around me more. So I'll often move around like my around to different buildings on campus. Um, and I'll use that walk as actually part of my break. Or if I'm at home, I'll switch from my room to our dining room, to our kitchen island, to like our music or library room. Um, you just want to make sure that once you move to another study environment, there's, again, little or no distractions there as well. You also want to bring snacks and water. Um, your mind and body both need nourishment, so don't forget to eat and drink water. Um, bringing them to your study space can be a really good way to avoid making excuses uh, for leaving your study spaces to grab them, if that's something that you struggle with as well. Um, when we're studying, we also do want to consider our five senses. So we can ask things like we were talking about. Does your study area have any visible distractions that you can remove? Um, how is the lighting of the room that you're in? For some people, you know, fluorescent lights is like the best study environment for them. For other people, they want softer lighting. So again, find what works best for you so that you're able to study for longer and not get distracted. Um, you wanna check in, you know, does your study area have any smells that are distracting? Um, are you, are these, smells, you know, making you hungry or make your nose drip. If they're making you hungry, maybe that's a sign that you need to adjust your schedule and you need to just, you know, go go get some food. Um, or maybe you're in an old library and things smell kind of funky and that's distracting you. Maybe that just is a sign that you need to switch which which place you're setting in. Um, I, I hope that you weren't tasting anything in your study area, but if you're chewing gum, for example, um, is the taste or the motion of that distracting you from your work? That's something to keep in mind. Um, you also want to check into your, your sense of touch. So is there anything in your sensory environment that you're touching that's distracting you? Um, trying to think of an example of this. I once was in a chair in, in the egg forestry building at the U of A here. Um, and the chair was just so uncomfortable that like, I felt like physically uncomfortable. So that, that was like a sign for me. I was like, okay, I have to, I have to switch my study space because this chair is so uncomfortable. Um, and then finally, like checking into our sense of hearing. So what are you hearing in this study space? Um, are the people talking around you? If there is people talking around you, are they distracting? Um, or is a quiet room actually more distracting for you? Uh, for some people, they find that the silence is actually almost too expansive. So it's, it's distracting for them. Um, you want to kind of think about what type of music you're listening to and if that's distracting. Um, for example, so one of my friends can't listen to music with lyrics because she'll start singing those songs and that distracts her. Uh, so she listens to only instrumental music now. Um, or, you know, 
not too sure how familiar everyone will be with this, but on the screen we have um, someone like the, the cartoon is kind of referred to as like the lo-fi girl. Um, if you go on YouTube and look up lo-fi music, you'll see lots of videos kind of with her um, or with like this, this gif in them. Um, you wanna switch things up too. So like I said, sometimes staying in one area can be um, kind of draining, kind of bring feelings of stagnancy. So don't let a stagnant study environment take you away from, from your studying. Um, and always again, reward yourself and take breaks. Remember to take breaks and give yourself rewards along the way for completing your tasks because you deserve them. So finally, let's hop into our next section um, about the importance of breaks. So um, there's a couple of reasons why breaks are important. First off, we can think about mental refreshment. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier, kind of thinking of our brain as a sponge. Your brain can only handle so much at once. Um, and when we give our brain a break, you're letting it kind of absorb all the information that you were just reviewing and learning. Um, and also potentially kind of, again, quote unquote, going back to that analogy, kind of wringing it out so that you can um, absorb more later. So taking breaks has been shown to increase your concentration um, and also just overall productivity because you're giving your time, your brain time to just kind of chill out for a little bit. Um, you may also get some increased creativity, which depending on what you're studying or if you're ever writing a paper can be super helpful going forward. Um, and again, if your brain is already saturated with information, um, just give it a break to dry out a little bit so that you can go back to studying um, and then it'll be it'll be ready to, to soak up all the information that you're giving it. So with that, you're going to see enhanced learning and memory from breaks. Um, giving ourselves breaks is also going to prevent burnout. So if you overwork yourself, both physically and or mentally, uh, your, your body and brain will let you know and you'll experience um, something called burnout. So burnout is essentially severe exhaustion that prevents you from being able to continue working on your task. Um, and it can manifest in a lot of different ways, such as irritability, decreased motivation, difficulty concentrating, uh, feelings of hopelessness, and also, um, you know, physical symptoms like headaches, getting, getting sick, like the cold or the flu, as well as experiencing stomach issues. So make sure that you're giving yourself breaks so that you don't hit a wall um, and make sure that during your longer breaks, you're taking care of yourself. Um, it can be really important to just kind of stop for a quick second here and think about what some of the ways that you you take care of yourself are. Um, for example, for some people, it might be, you know, creating space so that they can read um, like a casual book instead of like a textbook. Um, this can look like, you know, physically taking care of yourself, like taking a bath or watching a movie, exercising, eating nourishing foods and more. Um, breaks can also help us with our physical health. So uh, by this, I mean, you know, when you're on a break, give your give your shoulders a stretch, um, especially if you're, you know, on a computer, sometimes our posture can get really poor. Um, you can give your bum a break from sitting, give your eyes a break from focusing on whatever you were writing or doing. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, if you're on a device, it's really important that you're giving yourself your eyes a break um, from the screen, just so that your eyes stay healthy. Um, and then finally, obviously, breaks are gonna, are gonna help reduce our stress levels. So tying in with burnout, if you don't give yourself breaks, um, then you're just gonna go, go, go. And um, once that stress hits, and it's too much because eventually it will be too much. Um, your mind and body will make you take a break. <laughs> so, so do your do yourself a favor and just scheduling schedule in breaks so that you can refresh yourself, um, and then your mind and body won't force you to when you hit like that burnout or hit that wall there. Um, I do want to just mention you know a little bit of a caution on doom scrolling and other social media use. Um, so for those who who aren't um, familiar with the term doom scrolling, that's kind of where you go on to maybe TikTok or Instagram or YouTube and you kind of just continuously scroll through um, without like any timers or any kind of checks in place. So while taking your break, your study breaks on your phone, um, it's not like inherently bad and, and it might seem like a good idea. There are some downsides to it. Um, for example, anyone who uses like TikTok or watches Instagram reels, or if you're watching like videos on YouTube as a break, um, these videos are designed to be engaging and stimulating for your brain. 
um, you know, they want to get your attention. They want to keep it, especially again, when you look at TikToks and Instagram reels, like those really short videos, um, ultimately people are creating those because they want you to watch it. They want to keep your attention so that you, you view it. Um, and it can be really hard to transition from a break on your phone where you're getting all these bright colors and all these stimuli. Um, and then now you're trying to go back to studying with concentration and focus. So um, it's just super important to be aware of doom scrolling and if it's something that we we struggle with. Because um, if you start scrolling, there's a decent chance that you will keep scrolling again because these, these videos are designed to um, kind of trick your brain into wanting more or not even necessarily trick your brain, but it just does make your brain want more. Um, so if you start scrolling, there's a decent chance that you'll just keep scrolling even when your break is technically over if you don't set a timer. Um, because like I said, these apps are just designed to make you want more. So if you're studying or writing a paper on your laptop or device with blue light, again, we do want to just give our eyes a break and just take that time um, to let our physical health be, be okay there. Um, so here are some things that you can do on your breaks that do actually offer your brain some rest. So, you know, there's physical activity, kind of mentioned this throughout moving your body in some way. This can be like if you're on a longer break, maybe dancing or stretching or walking around, um, doing stretches for your shoulders, making sure that your posture is okay. Um, there's also mindfulness or med meditation. So, um, you know, for some people, it might seem like a little bit silly or counterintuitive to sit and meditate for a little while um, when you're studying, but it actually really does give your mind and your body a break. Um, if you find that you're holding tension from, from studying so hard, um, you might want to, you know, kind of do some visualization, kind of visualize that you're releasing some of that tension with every out breath as you're sitting. Um, I have a friend personally who swears by taking her study breaks by just laying on her bed and staring at the ceiling. And she just lays there and counts her breaths, focusing only on her breathing um, so that her mind and body can fully relax before she starts studying again. Um, you can get creative. For some people, they find that drawing or painting, singing playing like an instrument, um, anything again that you're kind of fully giving yourself that time to not think about studying or think about the material and actually just um, take a break from it. Um, in Canada, you know, we're really blessed to, to live in such a beautiful country. So um, sometimes nature breaks are really, really helpful for people. So this can be, you know, maybe a walk outside um, or just standing and getting some fresh air if you've been inside all day. Maybe you just go and eat your snack outside, something like that. Um, socializing is also another really um, easy way for, for us to sometimes feel like that, that break and that mental, mental break, sorry, from, from studying. Um, when we are socializing, though, we do want to make sure that we're still setting those boundaries and making sure that we're still giving ourselves enough time to study. Um, having a snack or as I like to call it a sweet treat can be really helpful too as a break because um, honestly if you've been studying for a long time treat yourself because you deserve it um, and additionally for some people they swear by power naps um, so again just making sure that you're setting your timer so you don't oversleep um, super briefly I did want to chat a little bit about self-care this was kind of briefly mentioned in an earlier slide when I said um, or I mentioned some self-reflection on, on taking care of ourselves. So um, when we look long-term, it's, it's really important to practice self-care. Um, so on the screen, there's an exercise called the self-care wheel, and I encourage all of you to do it. Um, so you can identify what some of your self-care practices are. Um, and if you have a balance in the ways you're taking care of yourself, that can also be really helpful. So it's just always nice to have some ideas that you can fall back on um, if you do ever identify that you're needing to take care of yourself, but you aren't sure what to do. Um, especially, you know, when when a lot of our mental resources are going to studying, um, it can be really hard to think of on the spot what we, we um, want to do or how we can take care of ourselves. So kind of using this as a preventative measure and kind of identifying what some of our self-care methods are beforehand can be really, really helpful in the future. Um, so for this self-care wheel, we can see that it's broken into physical, emotional, spiritual, and social self-care. So physical self-care is going to be things that positively impact our physical health and well-being. So this can be things like sleeping or eating, showering, working out, and, and more. Um, for some people, they say, they kind of say, uh, you know, doing their makeup or like getting ready for the day is also physical self-care because it's kind of 
that mindset of um, looks good, feel good. So that might be something too. Um, for emotional self-care, these are ways that we can express our feelings and emotions. So um, for some people, this might like, like might look like journaling or having a good cry about, you know, some of the things that are stressing them out, um, talking about things with someone. You know, I have someone in my life who swears by going on a drive and just like scream singing while they're on their drive to really like release some of the, the pent up stress that they have. Um, for spiritual, these can be things that help us feel connected to the world and foster a sense of belonging. So um, this can be setting aside time to like pray if you're religious at all, or it can be meditating or doing yoga. Um, it can be spending time in nature, anything that's really just going to help us feel connected to, to our world. And like I said, foster that sense of belonging. Um, for social interactions or social self-care, these are going to be things that help us feel connected and supported by others. Um, so really importantly, this can be asking for help when we need it. It can be volunteering and giving back to our community. It can be spending time with family and friends or more. Um, I also always encourage people when they when they fill out this exercise uh, to consider some self-care strategies that you would like to try. Um, so oftentimes when people fill this exercise out, they'll put things that they've used in the past. Um, but like I said, I encourage you to put out, put some things on here as well um, of things that you are kind of wanting to do or things that you would potentially try. Um, so maybe there are some things that um, also don't quite fit into these categories. Um, that's okay too. Maybe you have like a separate miscellaneous list beside your wheel too. Um, finally, I like to just always include ways to calculate your grade in these presentations because as students, um, it can be really helpful just to kind of be aware of where you're sitting in a class and it can really help uh, shape your goals and maybe kick your motivation into higher gear if you're not doing as well as you would like to. Um, and just a concluding note, not every strategy that was presented here in this presentation is going to work for everyone. Um, I, throughout, I've tried to give some examples of how me and, and my friends share differences in our study habits and time management. Um, so it's really just important that you experiment and play around a bit to figure out what works best for you. Um, don't let something not working once cause you to, to never try it again. Um, but do be mindful and check in with yourself if something doesn't feel right or if it doesn't feel like it's helping you. Um, yeah, so just wanted to, again, put our 